Okay, it is six o'clock and I'd like to honor everyone's time. So we will now begin. Welcome everyone to the cash bill legislation panel. My name is Lee Curran and I, along with Kylie Akiona, co-facilitate the Transformative Justice Task Force. We encourage you while listening to the discussion this evening to please reflect on your own feelings about cash bail, its purpose, its impacts, and how you can get involved in its reform. Many of you are here because you want to take action. And let me assure you that at the end of the evening, we will provide ways. Our Faith Action for Community Equity's Transformative Justice Task Force, who is sponsoring this evening's event, strongly and unequivocally support cash bail reform and is putting our faith in action by making it our legislative priority in the 2022 legislative session. We are an interfaith, grassroots, nonprofit group of committed folks who believe in the inherent dignity and worth of all people. That belief in humanizing our family members, friends, and all community members caught up in the carceral system is reflected in the design of this panel and the questions asked by our moderators, Nai and Carrie Ann. Our mission to transformatively change the criminal legal system is grounded in care and compassion and a deep commitment to transformative justice that will result in safer and healthier communities for all. This quote by Angela Y. Davis speaks to us boldly. Imprisonment is increasingly used as a strategy of deflection of the underlying social problems, racism, poverty, unemployment, lack of education, and so on. And now I will turn it over to Kylie. Aloha my koko. Just some background to start us off. Under Hawaii and federal criminal legal systems, foundational principles include equal justice under the law and that a person is considered innocent until proven guilty. Yet nearly half of the jail population in Hawaii are currently being the currently being detained pre-trial. In other words, they are awaiting trial and still legally innocent. Many are jailed pre-trial in severely overcrowded jails simply because they can't afford money bail. Others because of a probation, parole, or ICE office that has placed a hold on their release. Our jails and prisons are severely overcrowded and filled with people who are disproportionately Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islanders, have histories of limited education and employment, houselessness, mental health, and substance misuse, and exposure to trauma themselves. Studies, show, studies also show that children of incarcerated parents are five to six times more likely to become entangled in the criminal legal system, creating a revolving door in, instead of preventing pathways to crime in the first place, and holding people accountable when they have done harm, and while allowing, while allowing opportunities for redemption. I'm going to pass the mic over to Soon, our organizer, to go over the technical details. Mahalo. Mahalo Kylie and Lee for the introduction. Um, just some technical information. This is a webinar. Attendees will be able to see and hear the panelists, but no one can see or hear the attendees, so you're not. If you have any questions for the panelists, please include them into the Q&A. And if you're facing any technical concerns, please include them in the chat. Mahalo. Mahalo soon, and now I'm going to start introducing everyone. Um, and I'm going to start with our co-moderators for tonight. Everyone, please welcome Kano Oyo Nai Noa Nai Awo. Nai is from Waiehu, Maui. He currently lives in Makaha on the west side of Oahu. He's a student at UH Ma Noa, majoring in Hawaiian studies with a concentration in Malama Aina. Nai was also a panelist on our last panel talk story about the impacts of cash bail. Aloha Nai. Um, 
And our next co-moderator is Carrie Ann Shirota. Carrie Ann is a justice advocate who believes that transforming our criminal legal system makes fiscal sense and builds safe, healthy, and thriving communities. Born and raised on Maui, Carrie Ann is a graduate of Santa Clara University in California and the William S. Richardson School of Law at UH Manoa. Carrie Ann has 10 years of combined experience working as an enforcement attorney and investigator with the state and federal government enforcing fair employment, housing, and public accommodation laws. She previously served as the director for Maui Economic Opportunities BEST, or meaning be being empowered and safe together reintegration program, the Office of the Public Defenders, Parents and Children Together, and as a faculty counselor and, and, and lecturer for a Native Hawaiian program at the University of Hawaii at Maui College. Shaped by her family's personal experience with the criminal legal system, Carrie Ann continues to advocate for restorative justice policies that shift the state's spending priorities away from criminalization and incarceration and towards community-based rehabilitation, education, health, and human services. Thank you, Kylie. I will now introduce Senator Carl Rhodes. Senator Rhodes has served in the Hawaii State Senate since 2016, representing downtown Chinatown and the New Uwanu Valley. From 2006 to 2016, he served in the Hawaii State House of Representatives. Senator Rhodes is currently the chair of the Judiciary Committee. He received his law degree from George Washington University, his master's in Soviet and East European studies from the University of London, and his BA, his bachelor's from Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Welcome, Senator Rhodes. Next, we have Representative Sonny Gannadin. Representative Gannadin has been a lawyer, college instructor, journalist, youth mentor, and artist. As a lawyer, he has been a staff attorney at the Domestic Violence Action Center, a, co a court appointed attorney with the district court, and handled civil litigation um, for small businesses. He's taught in the American Studies and Ethnic Studies departments at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, at edited and written for local magazines, managed a youth program for young men and boys at the healthcare center Kokua Kalihi Valley and supported contemporary art as an artist and community organizer. Representative Gannadin was educated at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and the University of California at Los Angeles. His father was born in Manila and excelled in business and his mother is a Mexican-American and retired after 37 years as a special education public school teacher. Aloha a Representative Gannadin. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Representative Scott Matayoshi. Representative Matayoshi represents the 49th House District, covering portions of Kaniohe and Kailua. He currently serves as Vice Chair of the Judiciary and Hawaiian Affairs Committee and is a member of the Agriculture and Energy and Environmental Protection Committees. As a former school teacher, Representative Matayoshi knows the importance of a solid, well-rounded education. To that end, he believes supporting and developing teachers in the classroom is one of the keys to education. He believes Hawaii needs a strong agricultural industry as part of the foundation of a stable economy. He is also committed to addressing the high cost of living in Hawaii, including housing. Representative Matayoshi graduated from Punahou School and interned with the late U.S. Senator Daniel Keakaka while attending Claremont McKenna College. He returned to Hawaii after graduation to become a public school science teacher at Nanakuli High and Intermediate School while earning a master's degree in education from the University of Hawaii Manoa. He later received a law degree from the University of Hawaii. Welcome, Representative Matayoshi. And now we will turn it over to our moderators. Okay, aloha everyone. My name is Kano Eao Na Inoa Awo. Um, as some of you may have heard, I was one of the panelists on the last discussion we had. 
However, I have never moderated any panel discussions before, so just bear with me and let's see how this goes, mahalo. So um, first question, we often grow up learning in our schools that everyone has equal justice under the law. From your perspective, does our criminal legal system and current bill system treat all people equally and fairly, regardless of race or ancestry, whether a person is rich or poor, has a home or is houseless, has access to a public or private school education, or has physical and mental health challenges? So how do you guys want to do this? Do you, do you want us to each answer the question or do you want us to kind of just jump in or totally up to you? Um, yeah, I mean, however, each of you just whenever you are ready, just answer the question. Go ahead, Scott. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, if, if it's a hard one, I'm going to throw Sonny under the bus, but uh, I'll take the first <laughs> one. You actually started talking <laughs> first, so he's got dibs. <laughs> no, I knew I should have left three, You have three lawyers on the... On yeah, the I know, I know, I know. Uh, well, like, each of us is, like, very... Very like capable of the dodge. Um, <laughs> uh, well, well, let me, let me address the yeah. As a freshman the, representative, I, I believe I'll I'll take the short end of it. Um, first off, <laughs> thank you so much for um, allowing me to be here um, and allowing us to discuss the disparities in our criminal justice system, um, and allowing me to speak alongside my colleagues, Representative Matsuyoshi and Senator Rhodes, both of which have actually been advocates for pretrial. Um, incarceration changes in the last few years. Um, and thank you to Faith Action for your continuous advocacy, not just this year, but in years previous in trying to make a more equitable justice system, something that I truly believe in. Um, the question I believe is, do I think that um, the justice system pretrial treats people fairly? Um, and there's a big difference between equality under law and equality in practice. Um, there's a lot of discussion and literature about um, how we all have biases and how um, people in power express those biases in certain ways. I think the biases stack upon each other. So um, especially for young people, the kind of kids that I work with, um, a negative interaction with the teacher leads to a negative interaction with a principal and, and then one with um, another form of authority and an officer. And then it ends in statistics in which Pacific Islanders, Indigenous peoples, um, um, African Americans are significantly overrepresented in the justice system in increasing amounts um, as as they move through the justice system. Um, um, and it's my intent. I'm part of the legislature to um, to dismantle some of that legacy. Um, um, much of it based in colonialism and in um, the dispossession of native peoples and in um, and in unfortunate racist policies. Uh, like the other panelists, I have sworn to uphold the state and federal constitution both as a as an attorney and as a representative. Um, and I intend to do that. And I um, and I hope to bring more equity to the system moving forward. Yeah, I do want to draw the distinction between equality and fairness, too. I mean, I think there there is one there. You know, equality is treating everyone exactly the same, whereas fairness is more treating them as they come to you with their particular circumstance. Uh, you know, even if the law does treat everyone equally, I, I'm not sure that's really getting to the the spirit of the law, um, which is to treat everyone fairly instead. And, and, and bail reform is, is one, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of issues we could talk about with the legal system, but bail reform is certainly one where if you're treating everyone equally, you're not necessarily treating everyone fairly. You're not taking, you're, you're assuming that everyone is coming from the same circumstance, has the same socioeconomic status, uh, et cetera. And, and that's really just not the case. And what that, ha what that results in as Representative Ganadin uh, just described is an unequal distribution of the uh, of minorities and, and people of lower socioeconomic status ending up in jail because they can't afford to post bail. Whereas someone in a better circumstance or a better uh, socioeconomic situation that did the exact same crime or got caught in the exact same circumstances 
uh, could post bail and kind of go on with their lives and not have such a disruption. So I, I think it is. I think this is a really important issue. Um, I think it got really far last year. I'm, I'm really hoping that we're able to get it through the finish line this year. But I'm, I'm really glad that you folks put this panel together too to address this issue as we go forward. Um, you know, when when I see people who can't, when I, when I see this issue, I, I I really think about my kids or my, my students when I was a teacher. Um, you know, when I was teaching in Nanakuli, you could see the students whose parents were incarcerated or when a, a grandparent passes away or when, uh, you know, a parent goes to, goes, goes to jail for a while and, and there's, there's no parent left in the home, it, it dramatically affects their performance in school, their behavior, you know, everything just takes a total 180. And I, you know, I, I got to see that firsthand. It was, it was a terrible, terrible thing. I'm really hoping that we can, we can create less of that for the kids. Um, I, 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 I'm sorry, everything kind of, for me, leads back to my experiences in the classroom, but I, I certainly saw firsthand what even a brief incarceration can do, not only to that person, but to their entire family, and that's got to stop. <laughs> so hopefully we can, we can get this across the finish line. Um, yeah, looking forward to working with uh, Senator Rhodes and, and Representative Gannon to do that. Um, I mean, the short answer is no. Um, the, the reasons are varied and I think the, the the treatment is also varied I think I think you know, if we're talking about just Hawaii um, I think we do do some things right that other states don't um, something like 40 40 of the 50 states have elected judges which I think is a terrible idea and uh, you know they, they have to, they, they they're like us like the three of us they're up for re-election every few years and they tend to kind of have to put their finger in the wind to, to do that. And I, so anyway, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that Hawaii is, is, um, is fair, um, but I am suggesting there are other places that are even less fair, I guess. But I think the, the interesting part is why and we can talk about that more. Okay, mahalo. Thank you, Senator and Representative. So we'd like to hear more from you. Part of this is getting out Ed education information to our community to empower them to participate as citizens, community members in the legislative process. So could you tell us more about the proposed bail reform bills for 2022? I understand that there could maybe be some carryover from last session. How are these bills similar or different compared to other bail reform bills introduced in the past? I'll go first this time. Um, yeah, so the, the one that uh, the one that made it the farthest was one that I introduced. Uh, I think it was SB 1260, and it went to went to conference committee, which means that the, it passed had passed both the House and the Senate, but not the, exactly the same version. And so we formed conference committees to try to work out those differences. And I honestly don't remember what happened. It, it, I know it didn't make it. Um, I I mean, I th there's several bills out there. Mine mine was. You know, politics being the art of the possible, I thought that something that focused on lower level crimes, nonviolent crimes, would be the easiest one to pass. And, um, well, it might have been the easiest one to pass, but it still didn't pass. So, uh, I, you know, there, there, there may be stronger versions that get put in this year, uh, but I suspect that there will also be something along the lines of what I proposed last year. Thank you very much for that, Senator. Uh, Representatives Matsuyoshi or Ganadin? Yeah, 1260 almost passed last year. Um, it, it went through kind of the rigor roll, rigor roll of the House as well. Uh, and, and we did add certain things. Um, I, I kind of shoved Class C felonies down the prosecutor's throats to add that and, and some other, we, we made some other, sorry, my one and a half year old is knocking on my door right now. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we added some other things about, uh, so some other exemptions to to bail reform, but I think the the concept is all the same. That if we can cut people loose, if we don't need to put them in jail, um, if they're nonviolent, uh, etc., uh, not not repeat offenders, um, then they shouldn't be in jail. Uh, I'm intending to introduce something very similar to what came out of the House um, that was 12 SB 1260. It'll be HB something else when it gets introduced, um, which is very similar to what went to conference committee this last time, but but I am adding certain things. Uh, over this interim, I've had a chance to talk to a number of different judges. I talked to the Public Safety Intake Division. Um, I talked to the prosecutor's office. I just talked to kind of whoever I could related to bail reform. And I tried to really drill down to what are the uh, root causes 
that are causing people to remain in jail for longer than they needed to. And one thing I kept hearing time and time again from federal state judges, uh, the public safety division uh, was bail reports that judges were not able to get bail reports. So they, they weren't able to get the information they needed at the bail hearing in time to make a decision. So it, it, in, in that case, it wouldn't matter if they had more discretion to allow people to be cut loose because they don't know if they had just committed a murder or something and they really shouldn't be cut loose. So getting that information in a timely manner to judges uh, is very, very important because a lot of the times what happens is that they go to the bail hearing and it's continued because the judge doesn't have the kind of information they need to make a bail determination. And then they go right back to jail for another week or so. I mean, getting that information is, is very, very crucial. Um, in order to do that, we've got about five different, it'll surprise you to learn that we have about five different data, old databases in the state. You know, each department uses some different version of it uh, that, that really just don't talk to each other. The, the computer programs cannot talk to each other. So what we're trying to do with the Criminal Justice Research Institute, which, I, which I'm a part of now, is to get a program going, uh, get, hire a computer company to have a program to pull all this data into one place and make it available to judges or kind of whoever, whoever needs it in the government in order to generate those bail reports much quicker. Um, I also talked to the Public Safety Intake Division and one of the big uh, hurdles that they have to deal with is they have to physically go down to the jail to do all of these interviews necessary for the bail reports. So I'm putting something else in the bill to allow them to, you know, it's a new age, <laughs> allow them to do it by Zoom so we can kind of line people up. Uh, they won't have that travel time or whatnot. I'm, I'm hoping they can get through a lot more interviews faster by allowing video conferencing interviews as well. And that combined with the aggregated data uh, from the you know, HPD, all, well, all the PDs throughout all the, all the different counties um, and the prison systems and et cetera, and then the judiciary, allowing all that aggregated data to be in front of the judge very quickly, I think will do wonders for not having so many continued bail hearings and allowing people to uh, be cut loose a lot quicker. So, Definitely, you know, really important that we pass the first part of the bill, which is to create these exemptions for judges to allow them to cut people loose faster. But it's really important to address kind of the systemic problems too, um, which are getting just getting the information to the judge so that they can make the determination to set someone free or not. Thank you for that, Representative and Representative Cannon. Um, I'm grateful to Representative Monohiyoshi doing all the difficult work and working with the newly formed Criminal Justice Research Institute, which is housed in the Supreme Court. For years, opponents to bail reform and to changes into pretrial incarceration were saying, well, you know, if you let people out, we're going to see an increase in crime. Um, they, the new um, Justice Institute has to submit a report to the legislature just prior to the session. Um, so Dr. Harbinson over there is going to be doing that. Um, we actually have a test case, which is kind of rare here. Um, so they, the Supreme Court ordered the release of many individuals who were ordinarily incarcerated pre-trial due to COVID um, in, I believe it was March of 2020. Um, although the CJRI didn't come to any major conclusions, there was no significant increase in crime. Um, I think that's important to note. Also in other jurisdictions where they've had bail reform, they found similar, similar stuff. Um, I really think that in a forthcoming bill for bail reform, we have to include C felonies. We've got to add and beef up risk assessments. So the information that um, Representative Matayoshi is discussing, um, basically the judge should be considering as they do in the federal court, two main things. Is this person a danger to himself or herself or others? Or is this person a flight risk? Uh, we live on islands. So the latter is kind of an easy thing to deal with. Um, it's kind of ridiculous that there is 10 seasons of Dog the Bounty Hunter um, when you live on an island. Um, that said, um, really it should be about, a, about danger and then that can be assessed pretty easily. Moving forward, I'm hoping that we do that as well as we decriminalize a lot of things. Um, there are several um, things that are currently set as felonies, like most notably the, the theft statute, that if we bring it down to a misdemeanor, then it's not gonna be arrestable in the first place. Um, and it's another opportunity for officers to use their sometimes unfortunate biases that we all have to over-incarcerate the certain communities. Thank you so much, Representative. Thank you to all of you. Mai? 
Thank you, guys. Um, so next question, can FACE and our larger community count on you to support bail reform as a priority issue for this legislative session? What are your personal values that compel you to support bail reform? All right, my turn to go first. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, in fact, this was such a important topic to me last session when it came around that I asked Chair Nakashima, who's the chair of the Judiciary Committee, to allow me to take the lead on bail reform issues uh, for both the interim and this coming session. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I'm really grateful that he allowed me that uh, leeway. And that, that's why I was doing kind of the groundwork of meeting with all the uh, federal and state judges, the judiciary, prosecutor's office, et cetera, and, and you know, the public safety intake division as well, in order to try to push this this uh, this bill forward. Um, you know, if, if I if I didn't care about it, I would not have wasted all my time <laughs> over the interim uh, trying to pound out a better bill and really drilling down to the heart of the issue. So yeah, for me, definitely, I'm, I'm going to be uh, very focused on trying to get a bill passed. Um, you know, for me, I would love to get a large bill passed. It'll really depend on the other members in both the House and the Senate. What I really want to see is forward progress on this issue coming out of this session. You know, if we don't get the whole ball of wax, I'm okay with at least moving the ball forward because it, it's it's just been stuck for so long. Um, it's 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 very frustrating. And and I think I spoke about my motivation earlier. You know, just just teaching in Nanakuli for years uh, and and seeing all my students and their families and and the effects that incarceration has on both the students and their and and the parents and the grandparents and the aunties and uncles I mean everybody um, it, it's really really staggering and um, just seeing it first firsthand makes me want you know none no student ever to have to go through that Mahalo Senator Matayoshi um, Senator Rhodes or Senator Ganadin I'm sure I can go next um... Well, yeah, it's certainly a priority for me. I introduced the bill last year and, uh, you know, we moved it through my, it, it, with my support, it moved through my, I, I scheduled a hearing to move it through my committee and it moved through my committee and went, went to, it went to uh, all the way through uh, to the, to the conference committee. Um, you, know, you asked about the, the personal, personal beliefs that make me think that this is something important. And well, there's two of them. One is just practicality. So I'm reading from the, uh, Hawaii Criminal Pretrial Reform Report from December of 2018. So the use of money bail as a mean of, means of managing a defendant's risk is flawed as the setting of money bail alone does not correlate with the defendant's risk of non-appearance, danger, or recidivism. So right off the bat, there's a fundamental question of whether it actually works. And then the other, the other really glaring unfairness in it, of course, is that if you set, I mean, my understanding is judges will calibrate the bail amount to a certain extent to what they believe are the financial circumstances of the, of the defendant. But, uh, you know, if you're rich enough, uh, bail just doesn't really mean that much to you. If you're willing to walk away from a million dollars because you want to be free, um, you're going to do it. And you see it happen once in a while. There was this case in Japan not too long ago. I forgot the guy's name, but he was a Lebanese citizen or was a Lebanese extraction. And he was out on bail and he skipped the country and went to Lebanon. And that was the end of that, even though they were pretty sure he had done whatever it was. And it happens here too. The, there was a there was a, an attempted murder on in the building where the Lieutenant Governor lives downtown here in, in, in um, Honolulu. And um I, the guy made no attempt to escape. The woman was, I mean, it was surprising that she didn't die. But to me, that says mental illness. If you're not even aware enough of what's going on to try to get out of there, um, that's somebody, he bailed out, uh, but that's somebody who probably shouldn't get bail. He just shouldn't be out. They should either be at the state hospital um, looking at their mental health or they should be in prison or in jail until the trial comes. So there's some real fundamental unfairness is there, and that's what offends me. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, for me, I, I think what brings me to this conversation is uh, lived experience and professional experience prior to be joining political office. This is gonna be my second year as a state house representative. Prior to this, I've been doing mainly criminal and family law for the last 12 years. 
Um, I also managed to go to really good schools as a brown boy. And I um, remember experiences with authority and with officers as a kid. Um, I think there's also a set of motivations based on principles. Um, I don't believe, as the philosopher Hobbes did, that government and authority serve to rein in a savage humanity. I think that outside of coercive authority, people tend to behave in ways that are kind and communal. And I'm grateful to have seen a lot of that in traveling and in the inside of courtrooms and in jail cells. And I think that the, bear, the data bears all that out now. Um, and ending mass incarceration and the carceral state in the United States allows us to become the community we were meant to be. Um, I, I talk to boys often, I'm still in their lives after I ran a youth program. Um, I, I couldn't stop knowing them and, and I talk to them all the time about their interactions with officers and their interactions with with their teachers. And, um, and I know that um, for future generations, this is important. Also, this is part of a bigger and broader conversation about the justice system. Um, we still have a state relationship with private prisons. We have a thousand human beings, mainly Native Hawaiians, who are housed in Arizona. Um, the, um, the state facilities, they can move human beings all around. Um, so if we were to use bail reform as well as a variety of other tools, we could end the state's contract with private prisons fairly quickly if we got the numbers down to an appropriate level to approximate the need for public safety. Mahalo, Senator Ganadin. Carry on. I'm a rep. I'm a rep. I'm low. Oh, oh, I'm low rep, the, rep, representative. I'm a boy. I'm like, 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 i actually taking steps through the legislative process to find solutions to these challenges for our community. So with that, we'd like to ask you sort of turn to looking at other states and other jurisdictions. Some other states, other jurisdictions have enacted measures specifically relating to bail reform. Um, notably, New Jersey has paved the way. They implemented these changes in 2017. The new system starts with the assumption that innocent people should not be in jail people can be held only if their release poses an unacceptable flight risk or poses a danger to the community with the default approach of keeping people out of jail. And they actually have an instrument that's utilized to help them make that assessment. And as a sidebar, since we're sharing with our community, the federal criminal legal system eliminated money bail throughout the U.S. in 1984. So this is something that has been done years ago at the federal level. So it's not necessarily something that's considered radical. It's actually something that has been in place at the federal level for many years. Despite some of the strong opposition in New Jersey from some law enforcement and the bail bond industry, diverse stakeholders from all branches of government and the community proceeded with reform. And it's really amazing their results. Outcomes include reducing the pretrial population between 30 to 40 percent. And at the same time, approximately 91 percent of all people continue to show up for court appearances. And there was not an increase in crime, which is some of the fear factor that's put out as opposition to bail. And part of their success also by providing people with pretrial support services to be successful in the community rather than being warehoused in jail. So what outcomes do you envision for meaningful bail reform in Hawaii? What kind of outcomes would you like to see bail reform effectuate? Maybe this time we can start off with, I think if I have it correctly, either with Senator Rhodes or Representative Ganadin. Um, ideally, um, if we adopt the, what you just noted, um, people who don't belong in jail won't be in jail. I mean, it's, it's a basic matter of human rights. Well, um, I'm trying to reread this question that we got in the chat. How will it improve people's lives? 
and they're charged with crime. Everybody deserves a day in court, obviously. Um, and that's like per the constitution. Um, but do you think, have any sort of like maybe benchmarks you'd like to achieve? Like in the case of New Jersey, they actually have re reduced their population jail by 30 to 40%. Is there some, is there a particular benchmark or outcome? I got one. Yeah. My magic number is 1,000 human beings. Um, it is, it is <laughs> one. Um, and, and because that's how many people we currently house in the private prison. Um, and most of the folks that are in the private jail are at Saguaro or at Red Rock. They're serving for C felonies. You can serve a C felony in any one of the county facilities. If we reduce um, bail numbers to an appropriate amount and make those facilities safe, habitable for people to serve their time in, they can come back home. That's my number. Okay, thank you. And Senator? Uh, I, I, I don't have a magic number. I, I just think that there's a lot, of, especially for ones that were covered by the bill that I introduced last year, people who are not violent, um, there's just no reason for them to be there. And I think that I think the experience from other states is that you can have a non-cash bail system that will get people back to court at the same percentage rate, at least, as, as what we have now with bail. And it's a lot fairer for reasons that we've talked about already. Um, I, you know, if you, and I agree, that there, I agree with uh, uh, Representative Gannon that the, uh, that having people, having Hawaii prisoners in, on, in Arizona is just ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense on all kinds of levels. Um, it's cheaper and that's why we started doing it. But, but if you bring all those guys home, uh, then the, the numbers start getting tricky even. I, you know, I, I, I depart from some of my liberal friends on this because it looks to me like even if, if you brought them all home, because I think it's more than a thousand. I want to say it's like 1,700. I can't remember. I can never remember, but it's, it's, it's a big number. And even if you brought them all home, then you got to have the right kind of cell for them. And um, I'm still not sure whether the numbers work out if you, if you, if you had a thousand fewer people in pre-trial lockup, which tends to be a fairly low level of, um, still very expensive, but a fairly low level of, um, I mean, OCCC is notorious for escapes. And some of my constituents are guards there. And they say the only, basically the only reason people don't leave all the time is because just they're being nice to the guards, you know, some respect for the guards so they don't leave, but it's apparently quite easy to get out. And, um, yeah, so I'm not sure how all that works out, but the, the fundamental point is there's no reason that a whole bunch of these people need to be there to start with. Thank you, Senator. And Representative Matayoshi, what do you envision in terms of outcomes? Do you have any benchmarks that you would like to achieve through bail reform? Oh, well, using prices right rules, um, I think my number is going to be 1,001 <laughs> to make sure to really squash Sunny there. Uh, no, I, I think that, that, that Sunny's got the right idea. I mean, I think the benchmark a logical benchmark is bringing people home from the mainland. Um, you know, as, as a half Chinese person, I'm, and my wife will tell you, I'm extremely cheap. Um, spending money to house people or to, to incarcerate people that don't need to be there is an incredible waste of taxpayer money. Uh, I mean, that, that money should be spent on, uh, on reducing recidivism, on, on, on drug rehab. I mean, we have so many other better places to put that money. Uh, reducing our jail population is sort of an easy, I mean, not only is it the right thing to do, it's also an easy cash grab and bringing families home from the mainland to uh, allowing them to have their support networks next to them and visiting them in, in jail or prison. I mean, that, that's, that's huge. And I think that really uh, affects the way uh, the outcomes for people when they're, when they're finally released, having that support network there the whole time. Uh, so bringing people back from the mainland, whatever number that is, be it a thousand, be it 1700. I mean, if we can reduce the uh, current jail population here enough that we can bring people back, that I think would make a significant impact in our state. So that, that, that's a great, um, a, a great start, I think. And, and again, if we can't bring them all back at once for, through one bill, that's fine. If we can bring half of them back, I'd be also happy. You know, what I really wanna see here is progress next session. You know, I, and sometimes we can get caught up and let, let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, and I, I, what I really don't want this session is for people to come out and say, well, this isn't enough, so we're not going to support it. This isn't, you know, solving the problem completely, so we're not going to support it. You know, if we're able to, well, first of all, you have to understand that there's another, there's another side pushing pretty hard in the other direction. 
But second, if we can bring, if we can make some progress on this issue, even if it's not the whole ball of wax again, we, we can try again the next year to make even more progress. But let, let's let's take the progress we can get this next session if, if we can make some motion on this issue. Great. Thank you for that. I just want to add, looks like in the comments, Kat Brady, as of November last month, there were 1,115 people in Arizona. And over the last 20 some years, that number has fluctuated. It's gone up, it's decreased somewhat depending upon what's happening here. But it's encouraging to hear that all of you are in consensus that we should bring our people back home, that it helps to have support groups for people to be closer to their family through visitation. It actually had their studies to show that it can decrease recidivism, having family connections. And maybe that's some other future discussion about out-of-state prisoner transfers. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, Nai. Thank you very much. So um, based on decades of research, the data shows that Native Hawaiians are disparately arrested, convicted, and more likely to serve longer terms than any other racial ethnic group in Hawaii. Similarly, Pacific Islanders, African Americans, and Filipinos are also disparately incarcerated in our jails and prisons. Will bail reform address and reduce these racial and ethnic disparities in Hawaii? So I, I, I know this is very race-based and I think that it will, uh, but not, I mean, it, it will, but that, that's not the, the thrust of the bill. You know, the, the bill is not, not going to say that the purpose, you know, that, that Native Hawaiians need to be, that, that, that judges need to weigh people different based on race. That, that's, that's really not going to happen. I, I mean, I, I don't think that's constitutional either, but in the effect of having uh, bail reform, I think that will indirectly uh, affect the populations that you just just described. But I, I want to be very clear that you know there's not going to be a stated line in these bills that you know judges should weigh race differently. That that's not going to happen. And, and, and you know I'm not, I'm not saying that that's necessarily what your question was asking. I, I think that bail reform will do what what your question is asking. Um, I just want to be careful. But anytime race comes up with with the law, I get a little a little nervous. Mahalo, Representative Matayoshi. All right. Um, I'll, I'll go. Um, it will hopefully reduce the um, um, statistically significant over-incarceration of Native Hawaiians, which is similar to other indigenous peoples around the world. Um, the effects of colonialism um, are being felt to the 21st century. Um, I was teaching in ethnic studies for a few years and it's hard to fathom, but a lot of what it meant to be a Native person was illegal about 100 years ago. The rights to gather, the rights to sing, the rights to to dance, the right to do any of your cultural practices, um, the right to speak your own language. Um, it was illegal for um, African Americans to travel freely throughout the country. It was illegal for immigrants to own businesses and do a variety of other things. We have, although we have the 14th and 15th and 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution, which I've sworn to uphold, we also have a deeply racist history. Um, we can only afford a we can only hope that this is one thing that will strike at and making a more equitable system. Um, I am interested in front end, um, front end work. So that's why I still work with kids. I'm, I'm working on some issues that have to do with the juvenile justice system and in um, in bringing the family courts to communities instead of having to bring communities um, to the family court. Um, and then there's a variety of tools that we can we can continue to use to dismantle these historical structures of racism that were put in place. Um, for me, a big part of it is just acknowledging that that is a, a significant part of our history. Um, uh, once you acknowledge it, you can um, acknowledge that there continues to be disparities and and um, and fulfill the dreams of the Fourteenth Amendment. Mahalo, Mahalo, Representative Senator. 
Yeah, I think it probably, I, th I think the, the, the system, it is a systemic problem starting with, you know, kindergarten and on up, but there's several steps in the legal process that happen before you get to somebody being held before pre-trial. I, I think it's probably not going to make that much difference in terms of who gets charged and who's going to be there. Or I think it will make an important difference is that it, it will be much less disruptive for that person's life. So if you're, you know, if you're a, a somebody who works for uh, for an hourly wage and you all of a sudden you're in jail for three days because you can't make bail, uh, you know, I don't know what maybe right now where people are trying to have a hard time finding finding employees, they keep you. But I would guess in a bunch of times you're gone that long and your job's gone too, and then you're you're. Then it just then you're you're in danger of a of a a really bad spiral. So so what I think it will do is make it so that you know if you can if you can um, re, if you're released more or less immediately on your on whatever conditions are set by the judge for showing up for your your court date, uh, you won't disrupt the rest of your life nearly as much as it can now. Thank you, Carrie Ann. So every legislative session in Hawaii, a few thousand bills are introduced. Many individuals, agencies, organizations, corporations, groups, they lobby for their particular bill to become law. In addition to supporting bail reform based upon the principles that all of you espouse relating to fairness and equity, there's also a compelling argument, and Representative Matayoshi also touched upon it. There's an argument based upon fiscal economics and that bail reform would save the state money. Currently, we spend over $215 a day approximately to lock up one adult in jail, and that amounts to approximately $78,000 a year. And I am sorry if I'm misquoting this. I don't have the latest data, but I know at one point recently, we spend approximately, for comparison, about $20,000 or less than per child in public schools. So we're far outspending to incarcerate people rather than education. So do you support investing cost savings from bail reform into pre-trial diversion and community-based services for case management, housing, healthcare, treatment, education, job training, counseling, transportation, all of the things that we know through evidence-based practices help people to be successful in our community? And I'm sorry, I lost track whose turn it is. So if any of you would I like think it's, I think it's my turn to go first. Um, you, yeah, of course. I, I don't, um, I think the amount of money saved compared to the whole budget, which is, um, <laughs> I don't know what the budget is off, offhand. I think it's uh, 13 billion, uh, all forms of financing. Does that sound about right? Um, so, you know, you're, you're talking about money. You're, it's not, it's real money, but it's not enough to solve the, the affordable housing crisis, for example. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we can, um, invest more heavily on things that would keep people out of jail in the first place, then, it, then it's a virtuous cycle. Wonderful. Thank you, Senator. The representatives? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, you know how cheap I am. Um, if, we were, if we were able to save money, that, that's huge for me. And, and I think uh, you, and I touched on it before, I think that's the angle we need to take for uh, for the opposition to, to these bills too. I think, you know, having the human aspect is very important, obviously something I support, but a lot more people who may be more hesitant on that can get behind the fiscal aspect of, look, we're, we're wasting money. This is, this, is, this is dumb. It's taxpayer money that we're pouring down the drain. Um, you know, we can show them that money spent on the front end to uh, have, you know, for drug rehab, for housing, et cetera, uh, can keep people out of jail and therefore it's a good investment of money um you know you, you don't even really need to touch on the human side of things although, although we should i mean it's a very important side of things but you know not everyone in the capital is the same and, and not everyone in the state is the same and in order to get a coalition large enough to pass a bill through the state or through the capital which is kind of a microcosm of the state you need to appeal to more groups than uh yeah, or, hell, you need to appeal to as many groups as you can. And having different arguments and different ways to talk to people about an issue, I think is really important. And one way to, to, to get something across the finish line. 
So yeah, um, having the number, uh, the cost of, of incarcerating someone and using that as more of a fiscal responsibility argument, I think is a good one and something I also support. Thank you for that, Representative Masayoshi. Representative Gannon? First off, we have to talk about numbers because there's currently a plan to build a new Oahu Community Correctional Center. Um, it might cost half a billion to a full billion dollars here on the island of Oahu. And I think that we need to figure out how large that facility needs to be prior to us getting anywhere further down with that plan. Um, the second other thing I'd like to talk about is, although we're talking about numbers, what is the opportunity cost for housing a person who doesn't need to be housed in, in a correctional facility? What is the cost to humanity? Um, so um, I want to go down the fiscal route too and say that, you know, this is going to save the state X amount of money. But um, I also know that there's a loss to human beings who are stuck in jail. Um, I remember reading the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was in high school and him talking about West Indian Archie, who he got into a big argument with and he got uh, sent up state for. And he said he could have been a mathematics genius. He could have been a law professor, um, but he spent the rest of his life in jail. Um, there's a lot of humanity that we're losing. Um, and we don't know the numbers about that, you know, just by, by locking people up, by not giving them the mental health services that they need, by not giving them a leg up to be contributing members of our society. Um, $219 a day, that might account for food and shelter. Um, and some of those costs are actually sunk right now because we've got contracts with sheriffs and with their union and with a variety of other distributors. And it's a whole chain. Um, and that takes a long time to dismantle. So it's not as if you just um, release one person and you save $219 to the state. It doesn't work like that remotely. Um, but it's little by little, we change the system and then we save a lot of human beings, we save a lot of money. We don't know the numbers. That's what I think. Thank you for that. I think it is important to talk about the fiscal costs as well as the human costs, because the reality is that there's only so much money and resources and how do we use that? Do we invest it into justice reinvestment, these types of services? And I also want to share with our audience as well that Part of what we're spending right now, we should look at the outcomes. So for the amount of we're spending per day, $215, about $78,000 per year per person, what are our outcomes? And currently recidivism rates, so the rate of which people are either going to have technical violations, parole, probation, and may end up back in jail or prison or have new arrests, new convictions, 45 to, to, six, to about 60% of um, all individuals in our adult prison system recidivate. And so is this truly the best investment of our resources? And, and just again, a parallel, partly because we have Representative Matayoshi and the importance of education. If 45 to 60% of all of our students in public schools were to fail, you know, to fail, there would be outrage in our community. And so I think it's so important for us to ask, like, are we making a good investment? And it sounds like there's consensus that we can use that funds in better ways to really uplift and build a safer, healthier community. Nae? Um, so what advice would you give to our community to champion bail reform to the legislative finish line let's start with senator rhodes oh well uh, look generally to pass a bill uh especially a big well this isn't that big a bill really i think it might it might pass um i think we got a pretty good chance of passing something next year um, but having said that, generally what you need to pass a bill is internal champions, which you have in sitting in front of you, or there's other people too who are interested in the topic, and you need external pressure. So the external pressure takes several forms, and one, um, one of them is writing and calling, showing up to hearings and testifying in favor, which of course it goes through more than one committee, so you need to do that more than once, and that all helps. And if you get a lot, and the more people you get, the better. The other part of it that doesn't people don't like to talk about so much but it does matter is is the campaign side where you know we we all run for office we're actually we're all running for office next year 2022 because of redistricting and if you're in a financial position where you can support you don't have to give to me since i'm bringing this up i but people need money to run for office and i have i for one have 
introduced bills and pushed them pretty hard to, to switch to a public financing system and have failed. So at the moment, we're still with uh, contributions are necessary. Um, you can even even if the contribution is fairly small, if you get a bunch of your friends to show up at somebody's fundraiser and give and every, everybody gives 50, 25 bucks or something, and then they get to talk to the to the legislator one on one about, hey, you know, how come you're not passing bail reform? Uh, that is an effective tool without, you know, getting into the I mean, the max you can give to a House race is two thousand dollars. The max you can give to a Senate race is four thousand dollars. I realize most people don't have that kind of money to spend, but I I don't see how you can it is a factor and you do have to keep that in mind. Okay, thank you very much, Senator. Um, let's hear from Representative Matayoshi. I hear what the Senator is saying to not donate to his campaign, but feel free to donate to, to mine and Representative Ganadin's. That, that's very reasonable, very reasonable suggestion. Um, but you know, I think the, the heart of, of donating and testifying to comes down to the sacrifice that you are showing that you are willing to make for a specific cause. So that, that, that you know, in, it, in dollars and cents, um, you, it, it's directly relatable to campaign donation. You know, if you really, really support a candidate, um, Hillary Clinton, you, you name it, Bernie Sanders, uh, how much do you really care about them? I mean, do you, do you $10 care about them? Do you $50 care about them? Do you $2,000 care about them? I mean, that makes a difference. And, and it's the sacrifice you are willing to make too. You know, if you're Bill Gates and you need to donate two grand, um, okay, thank you. But if you are a, a working individual who, you know, you, you, you've really got to sacrifice for that two grand, I think that two grand makes, it means more. And, and if you draw that line to testimony, uh, you know, you, you send in a form email where you just have to type in your name and email address and, and the, the system sends it for you and it says the exact same thing, that, that really doesn't mean as much. I mean, it, the, the time you took to do that was 10, 10 15 seconds. You know, and that, that really comes through to us. If you take the time to do a personal email to us telling about your life situation or your, your life experiences and how that relates to it, that means a lot more. And if you're willing to take time out of your day to actually physically testify, you know, be it by Zoom or by, by appearing before one of our committees, that, that means even more. Right? That's the dedication. That's the commitment you're showing to that cause or to that idea or to that bill. And I think that really comes across. So when you are deciding to testify or to support a candidate or, or whatnot. Uh, and, and this is mainly for testimony. We really think about how you're going to do it and what, how you're doing it shows your commitment to that cause, because I think that really makes, that does make a big difference. Mahalo, Representative Matayoshi. Um, Representative Gannady. Um, of course, I'm going to need some cash to run for office again. Um, but make more art, um, tell more stories, bring more beauty into the world. You know, people don't sing songs about campaign donations, they sing songs about love and they sing songs about the mountains and the flowers and the ocean. And our ancestors did that. And so sing those songs and share that beauty with the world and bring it forth and hold that in your heart when you do your advocacy. Um, I think that for me, I'm trying to close the gap a little bit between the work that artists do and the work that we do in policy. Um, there's a wonderful movie called Out of State, which follows um, the experience of two Native Hawaiian men who were incarcerated in Saguaro. And one of them made good choices, one of them made not so good choices and in, in, in how they fared after, after incarceration. And it, and it followed them and won a uh, best a uh, local feature in the Honolulu International Film Festival about three years ago. I love the movie. Um, I think that that's the kind of thing that lasts in people's minds and and uh, lasts in the memory of humanity more than the temporal politics that we're engaged in. So make more of that. Tell more stories. It's narratives that last. Um, and And do it. I mean, you're wearing a shirt from one of the most powerful indigenous activists in the history of the 20th century. And she was also a poet. I think she was a poet first and, and an activist second, but the poetry came first. Um, she, uh, she spoke with conviction, but she said it pretty. Um, and, and, that, and, and that never went away. Um, 
So of course I need cash to run, but um, bring more beauty into this world and, and then share that um, in whatever form you can. More stories. Thank you so much, Representative Gannon, for that answer. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Carrie Ann. Okay, so we're like winding down. Uh, we're going to ask another one or two questions, and then we're going to be opening up and turning it over for our audience to share some of their questions. We'd like to hear from you. What gives you hope? that meaningful bail reform will be enacted this particular session. And maybe we can start off with Representative Ganadin since he just, or maybe Representative Matayoshi, I'm sorry, I'm losing track here. My son just came in, I got distracted, I apologize. I mean, just, just real quick, um, the, the thing that gives me hope is that we almost did it last year. So I, I think we're close, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I had time during the interim to kind of delve down to, to address a couple other problems, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I sorry, I've been, I've been meaning to meet with Senator Rhodes. It's just um, probably not going to be able to do it for real until January, but you know, we've got time during session as the bills move through committees to make the necessary adjustments and things like that. I, I think if nothing else, something's going to come out that's going to need a conference committee and uh, hopefully this time we can get it across the finish line. So we're, we're you know, we're, we're, we're pretty close. <laughs> I think we, I think we were, I actually thought it was going to already happen uh, last session and then we wouldn't be sitting here, which would be great. Um, but, you know, maybe we won't be sitting here next year. Thank you so much for that, Representative Matsushi. Senator Rhodes, what gives you hope that bail reform will be enacted this session? Oh, very similar to uh, Representative Matsushi. It, it was close and usually it takes a few years to pass a, a meaningful, you know, a, some bills are small enough topics that you can get through, get them through in a year, but you, most bills take more than a year. And of course, it, it, the, the topic has been on people's minds for a while. I mean, the uh, the Hawaii criminal pretrial reform report that I was quoting from earlier was uh, came out in December of 2018, and of course, we passed a big pretrial reform bill in 2019. And uh, so there's, there's, I think there's some momentum there, and um, yeah, I'm I'm reasonably optimistic that the the stars are aligned. What, what I think of when I think of how the legislature works is, I don't know if you've ever seen these uh, things where you drop a ball and there's all these um, pegs that stick out and the ball bounces off the pegs and most of them pile up in the middle. Well, to pass a bill, you got to get a ball to bounce out to the side a ways. And if you, if you scooch the thing back and forth, uh, it, it comes out farther to one side. So I think the, the underlying facts have scooched the, the pegs to one side, and then we have a pretty good chance of getting a, a ball to the finish line that will be near one end, which, will, which would count as a passage. That's not a very good analogy. I'll come up with a better one next time. But no, thank you for that, Senator. We have a visual. We're going to keep shifting and moving to make sure it gets to that finish line that you speak of. And, and Representative Gannadin? Um, I, I agree with Representative Matayoshi and Representative Rook and Senator Rhodes who came close last year. We should be able to pass it this year. Um, but I want to acknowledge your work and, um, and the fact that people are paying attention to this. Uh, it's communities that tend to lead. It's it, usually the ideas, the, the bright ideas don't come from people working in the building. Um, the, the bright ideas come from communities and lived experience. Um, so the fact that you're here, the fact that you're advocating, that you're asking all these tough questions of us who actually kind of agree with you on most everything, um, it, it means something. It means that it's a critical mass of the community who agrees with you. Um, so please continue to do what you're doing. And um, for those of you who are watching, um, it's an election year. Consider running for office, not against any of us, of course, but consider engaging in the political process um, in some way or form in the future. Um, this is discussing the criminal justice system is one way to do that, but, um, but, but there's a lot of other ways to gain entry into it as well. Well, thank you so much for that. And I, I, we have a few more. So I wanna ask this question. This is probably more like technical advice for, for all of you. Sometimes at legislative sessions, people, they'll call the bill and, and someone will stand and say, I stand on my testimony. Maybe they've submitted something in writing or email. Do you still encourage in those instances for people to actually tell their story rather than just relying upon what's written, especially with so many, so much written testimony coming in? And is there always time to read through 
um, what's sent in. So would you encourage people nonetheless, even if you submit written testimony to still testify and tell their story? Yeah, definitely. I, I don't even know why you would appear in person or by Zoom just to stand on your testimony. <laughs> you know, it's it, if, if you're making that time sacrifice already and, and we get to you, I mean, I, I, you don't have to tell your life story, <laughs> but if you want to take 15, 30 seconds to at least hit the major points of your testimony, you know, make, make, your, make your major points known because, you know, we get a lot of written testimony, especially for some of the bigger bills. And there is not physically time to go through all of them sometimes. I mean, you, you've got all these bills coming through. We sit on multiple committees. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of written testimony. Sometimes if you're a committee member, you don't get to see the committee testimony until like an hour before uh, the, the committee hearing starts. So, and, and that's all your committees, you know, you're, you're not just, and you're working on your own bill. I, there's a lot going on in that building. So when you have our attention, and even though you've submitted written testimony, take, take a second, you know, we're not gonna hold it against you. It, it, don't start reading from the dictionary <laughs> or the phone book, but take, take a second, hit the main points, um, you know, be respectful of everyone's time. If there's, a, if there's a ton of people behind you testifying, you know, you don't want to drag the committee hearing on forever. But definitely, if you have made the time to appear, take a little bit of time to hit your main points and make your voice heard. Don't just stand on your written testimony. And like I said, the, the time commitment, you know, use it. Thank you so much for that. And then I know Senator and Representative, if you want to also add anything more. I would, I, I would say generally that's correct. Um, you know, if you're going to sit around there two hours waiting for your turn to come up, don't don't just give it away. Um, having said that, there are certain situations where I, I probably wouldn't read the testimony because, although as a rank and file member of a committee, you, you don't have time to read all the testimony of all the committees you're on. The chair or his staff or both or her staff or both uh, do read all the testimony. So. Uh, and, and also, if you're sitting there, you know, and you have, and the members have the testimony in front of them and you're reading it, I don't know. I, I, I agree with uh, Scott, hit the highlights. But of course, in my committee, uh, you have two minutes because there are so many testifiers. So you won't, you won't get to go on and on. You, so you, so you got to cram it into two minutes. But the other, the other caveat is if it's like right near the end of when, when our time in our room, we only get the room for a certain amount of time. And if we're right down at the end and a whole bunch of people have already gone before and they were all in favor of it, then I would keep it really short. Don't blow it. You're winning at that point and, you know, make it really quick. Thank you for that. And Representative Kennedy? Of course, if you're there, you got to talk. Like, what, what, what are you, like, why did you even show up? So absolutely agree with the representative of the center on this one. Um, tell your story, tell your truth. Uh, we are a captive audience. We're elected and we're paid to sit there and listen to you and be respectful. Also, um, um, despite my best efforts, my brain doesn't turn on. Like for the first hour of me being awake, it's like, I gotta, I gotta take a couple cups of coffee. It's like, I'm doing my best to be present. And even if I read the testimony, it really helps if somebody's talking too. Sorry. It's just some of us need to hear it as well. It's like, it's a human thing. It could be something that I absolutely agree with, but like, just let me hear a damn voice. Thank you for that, Canon. Thank you for that advice. That will empower our community to, to utilize that in their storytelling and advocacy. Um, I just wanna say in sort of context again, that bill reform is not something that's necessarily new. It's something that it seems like there's building momentum and all of you are in consensus, but it's really interesting. I found that even in 1966, there was a B Bell Reform Act um, that President Lyndon B. Johnson spoke of. And at the time he said that the scales of justice were weighted not with fact, not law, nor mercy, but with money. And so this has been a longstanding issue. And I'm really encouraged to hear that all of you, that there's consensus. Each of you have principled positions on bail reform and having our system be more fair and equitable to all. And so with that, I'm going to be turning it over to, I believe, Kylie and Lee, and they're going to be sharing questions from our audience. Thank you so much, Senator and Representatives. I really appreciate participating on this panel with all of you. Yeah, mahalo, guys. Appreciate mahalo it. Mahalo, Carrie Ann and Nai. I'm going to start off with the first question from the audience. Um, what does what does the opposition to bail reform look like? What are these what are these specific arguments against these bills, and how can the opposition be influenced? 
Um, I don't remember the order and I apologize, but. I, I'll, I'll go first this time. Um, I didn't go back and look at the testimony to see where the opposition came from. My, so I'm doing this by memory. My recollection is mainly prosecutors and law enforcement side. Um, the argument is that it will allow people who are going to go commit crimes to get out again. And the, I think, but I think the real problem is just inertia. We've been doing it this way forever and people don't want to change. Yep, and I, I completely agree. I mean, the, the prosecutor's office had a, had a bit of a fit when I wanted to add in uh, class C felonies, um, you know, and, and it's, it's really a compromise between all the sides. So I don't wanna say there's one side opposing it and one side not, because I actually got pushed back from the other side, from uh, the people who wanted the bill to go even farther or further too. So when you say opposition, it's a little tricky. You know, uh, opposition to bail reform, the concept, or opposition to whatever bill is coming through, because you can actually catch it from both ends. And actually, when you're catching it from both ends, that usually means you're in a pretty good compromise position. You know, the, the best kind of compromise is when no one's happy. So, but we certainly got um, opposition from Shopo, from police unions, uh, from, uh, well, I mean, self-interestedly, uh, bail bail bondsmen, <laughs> uh, people like that. And then, you know, from my constituents too, uh, you know, I, I have a fairly uh, moderate section of Hawaii, I would say in Kaneohe. I mean, we, we, we've definitely got people here who uh, were not happy about, about uh, prisoners getting released through the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that were, are, are still convinced that, you know, if, if we release people from, uh, if, if we stop using bail, that crimes are going to go up, that, you know, we're allowing more criminals on the streets, things like that. So it does require some education on um, exactly what the purpose of, is of bail reform. Uh, and, and again, this is where the financial part comes into. Uh, people who are very, very against uh, releasing criminals on the street usually are the ones who are fiscally conservative as well and can be reasoned to of, do you really want to waste all this money, um, you know, incarcerating people when it could be used on XYZ? So that's kind of the way we we hit the opposition, I think, but that, that is sort of where the opposition, opposition is coming from. Um, yeah, I think the historical arguments against bail reform coming from the prosecutors, from police unions are gonna be kind of, um, if not discredited, put in serious question by um, the data coming from jurisdictions that have instituted it. So that's one of the benefits of being late to the party. You can kind of figure out what's working, what isn't working. Um, no statistical increase in crime in, in most of the jurisdictions that did this. Not most, any of the jurisdictions that were noted by the Criminal Justice Research Institute, which is going to be published to us and to the state of Hawaii in just a couple of weeks. Um, so we've got data now that suggests that this is a good idea. Um, we have narrative that suggests it's a good idea. The Arguments by the prosecutors, I think, are historically rooted in electoral politics. Um, the prosecutor is an elected position. Um, I'm not sure if there's a way around that um, to make it appointed, or even if that's a good idea. Um, but you know that the argument for bail is a big part of um, what happened like two years ago or a year and a half ago with um, um, with that that prosecutorial race. So yeah. Sorry, I just oh, want to add, I, oh, I really sorry, want to make ahead. sure, I really want to make sure we're not vilifying the other side necessarily, because we're going to need them and the representatives that they, and senators that, that represent them as well to pass this thing through. I mean, you, you have three people sitting here who are all for it, all for bail reform, but that we, we are not a representative cross-section of the, of the state capital. So I, I really want to make sure we don't alienate people um, on the other side that we really reason with them. I mean, they're, they're not coming at a, most of them are not coming at, coming at this issue with a, you know, I want to lock up as many people as I can, you know, as, as many minorities as we can. We, they, they, they're not thinking like that. They're, they're thinking of, you know, public safety. Uh, they're thinking of their cousin that's a police officer who's telling them things. Uh, you know, they're, they're I, I really believe that a lot of the people on the other side are still good people that are that are just motivated by different things. And what we need to really work on is appealing to their motivations 
And, you know, sometimes their motivations are based on, on false facts and we can correct those. But the, the fastest way to, to solidify someone against you is by saying, you idiot, don't you know that, that, that that's not the way we want to do things. And, and that's not the way we're going to do things at the Capitol with other representatives or senators. And I mean, and that's sort of our level on, on your folks's level, talking to other people in the community. I just really want to make sure we don't galvanize the opposition um, by trying to force our perspective down their throats. Try to see it from their perspective and try to see, you know, what motivates them to vote or to uh, advocate the way they do and, and try to try to convince them otherwise gently and politely and, and civilly. Mahalo for that reminder, Representative, um, and thank you everyone for your answers. But yeah, I totally agree. I think a big part of this, and I think Representative Matayoshi, you were saying that too, humanizing everyone, including incarcerated people, including the people on the opposing side of bail reform or the bills and legislature. So mahalo for that. The second question that I have from the audience is, the California Supreme Court recently released an opinion that basically said, making those that cannot afford bail to sit in jail is unconstitutional. How can that be leveraged this session for reform based on affordability? Um, I don't remember who started. Again, call my. Um, if it's a case arising, I'm going to be just a strict lawyer here. If it's a case arising out of California, of course, it's not binding authority. If it moved its way up to the Ninth Circuit, with which, which we are a part of, um, Hawaii, California, um, the West Coast states, then, um, then maybe um, it might be binding. Um, the argument could be made here for similarly situated pretrial individuals who are incarcerated. Um, and then we'll see if it makes its way up um, to our Supreme Court. Um, that said, I think California did it a little bit differently because they have a state system and a county system. So they they push a lot of the people who are serving time in the state facilities to the counties. County says we can't afford it. Um, so they state legislators used um, that um, that system to to effectuate bail reform in a way that that happened much quicker than we do because we have a we have a shared state system. Yep, just to echo, that's the California Supreme Court. Each state has its own Supreme Court. <laughs> I mean, we can we can look to them for advice or, or for suggestions, but it's, our courts certainly do not have to follow precedent coming from another state court. Um, if, if it was a federal court, like Sunny said, if it gets up to the Ninth Circuit or the U.S. Supreme Court, then federally we would need to, our federal courts would need to follow that. But our state courts still really, really don't, unless it's a federal supremacy issue. So, you know, California does its own thing. I think we'd be singing a different tune if some case the exact opposite came out of North Dakota and they were saying we should follow that. I mean, we'd probably say, hell no, we don't have to. So, you know, take, take it for what it, take, take, take it for what it is. Uh, California can lead the way on a lot of issues. Uh, so can we. Um, and hopefully our state Supreme Court will look to them for advice on how to manage things. But certainly a case coming out of there is not going to be binding in any way on us. I don't need to add anything more. Perfect. Mahalo, everyone. Um, our third question from the audience is, in 2019, the legislature passed a bill that allows for unsecured bail. This, the, bleh, the bill was signed by the governor, but public defenders have told me that no judge in the First Circuit has ever released anyone on unsecured bail, and the law has almost never been used in neighbor island courts. Why have our judges not allowed unsecured bail for defendants who meet the requirements of the statute? Carl, you want to take this one? I was a brand new legislator at that point, and Sonny wasn't even there. So maybe you know uh, or have more background. I don't know why that is. Uh, I'll try to find out. Um, it's, I mean, of course, you know, the, the sort of superficial answer, I believe Mr. Merce is an attorney himself. The superficial answer is that judges have a lot of, um, it's an independent branch of government, and they pretty much do what they want within the confines of the law. And if it doesn't require, if the bill, as I recall, the bill does not require that they uh, do unsecured bail. They don't have to. And so in their judgment, in their judgment, they haven't done it, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know why no one's chosen to do it because it seems to me there ought to be at least a few cases where that would be something they'd want to do. I think 
have a different answer. So I still represent people as a court appointed attorney with the district court here in the first circuit. So um, um, during COVID, I was doing what I ordinarily did, which is requesting that individuals be released on their own recognizance, OR, um, which to me is a better option. I, 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 so as a court appointed attorney, I serve individuals who qualify for the office, who qualify for the services of the Office of the Public Defender, but for whatever reason, they, they um, can't be served by the Office of the Public Defender. So I basically am a PD. Um, and in this instance, I just asked for OR. Um, and, it, and it seems like a much better option than some version of unsecured bail and less paperwork. That might be a quick answer. Hello, everyone. Um, our next question from the audience is, can Senator Rhodes and our other lawmaker guests please say more about politics being the art of the possible? despite the strategy failing with SB 1260 containing the most modest of proposed reforms, especially considering this was not the strategy behind success, uh, successful Illinois bail elimination legislation, legislation. It's a tactical call. Um, the, the bigger, you know, the, the reason, the reason I went with a, a, let me back up. So I personally think that probably and ultimately we should get rid of cash bail entirely and use different criteria for who gets released and who doesn't. Um, maybe there's maybe there are certain kinds of cases where it would still make sense to keep it, but I, I have my doubts. So having said that, you know, there was this, the, the 2019 bill that Mr. Merce was talking about. It had um, the Hawaii criminal pretrial reform recommendations, as I recall, had um, bail reform in it, and there was so much resistance to it that it didn't even it didn't get included in the larger the in sort of the home run bill. So looking at that, I was like, well, you know, we couldn't get it through there. So why don't we why don't we try for the uh, try for the single, and um, and if it works, then we know we have an argument for saying, okay, we can expand this, and it's not the end of the world. But it's totally a, a legislative tactical decision. I mean, and there are some issues it just doesn't lend itself to. I mean, I was heavily involved in the same-sex marriage debate years ago, and um, you can't really split the baby in half there. You have to either either you have same-sex marriage or you don't. And so you, I mean, we tried. We tried civil unions to sort of ease our way into it. But in the end, you know, it's a yes-no question. But this isn't a yes-no question. This is one where you could do it gradually and end up at the same result, assuming that people want to do that. Anyway, it's purely a judgment call on what do you, you think is going to work. Yeah, I think that might actually have been why it died in, in conference last year was uh, it was a difference between getting rid of all cash bail or getting rid of cash bail and under certain circumstances. So it, it's good that we're all on the same page on this, at least that, you know, we, we want to make, we want to see forward progress on this. Um, I, I know certain people in the house uh, aren't for this at all. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we've really got to, to come at it from a position where we want something to actually pass. You know, there's a difference between a bill that's a statement bill where you're putting it out there just to kind of make a statement and you know it's not going to pass, but, you know, this is what you believe absolutely. And, you know, doggone it, you, you're not going to make any compromises. And that, it's fine, but usually the, those don't pass. Um, that, that I found, uh, I think this bill is a much is a much more moderate step. That's much more palatable to to both sides of the House and the Senate. Uh, the, you know, the kind of the moderates, the more progressives, and the conservatives. I think this is a, a bill that everyone can kind of get behind, and we can make forward progress on it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's I, I like the description of this being a a very reasonable, or I can't even remember what the description was, uh, a, a very moderate bill of some sort, but I think that's a good description of it. I agree. Um, I've heard the metaphor of making sausage, with, which I think is gross for um, producing legislation, but that's totally the business that we're in. It's disgusting sometimes. Um, um, I'm just grateful that you folks are here and you continue to um, pressure us with these tough questions and you are here continuing to do this advocacy. And, and for those of you watching who I can't see you on the Zoom, right? we're just, I'm just so grateful for your participation, for you um, 
continuing to educate yourselves and educate us about um, your experience um, with the criminal justice system. Um, continue to put that pressure on your elected officials, not just us, but but everybody to, to make sure that this and the other reforms happen in the future so that we can ideally end mass incarceration in the state of Hawaii. Mahalo Noe Representative and Mahalo Noe Representative of Ma Representative Mariyoshi and Senator Rhodes. Um, I'm going to pass it on to my co-facilitator, Lee. Mahalo, everyone. Thank you, Kylie. This evening has been absolutely incredible. And I just wanted to acknowledge that um, as promised in the beginning, we have some action items. So don't bail out on us now, pun intended. Um, first of all, if, um, yeah, there's going to be something on the screen. You can sign up for our P2A, our phone to action texts, and this will alert you to opportunities to submit testimony. We are also creating an opportunity for you to learn more about this process of moving a bill to a law, kind of like that game with the ball that Senator Rhodes was referring to, and how to actually give and submit testimony. It's a little tricky and it, it's hard to navigate at first if you're new to it. So we will have a presentation. It's going to be given by Victoria from the public access room sometime next month prior to the start of the legislation session, which, by the way, will begin on Wednesday, January 19th. So there is a link there, and I think it's also in the chat. Um, we're going to follow up with this link for the phone to action. We're going to follow up with a slideshow that our very own Kristen Young created that has a lot of educational resources around cash bill. So mm -hmm. if you're reaching out to friends, family, the wider community, um, this these are good resources that will really help explain what cash bail is and its impacts. Um, our own task force made our own video and that is also in the slideshow. So I wanna finish out by thanking all of you for joining us in the Zoomiverse for this very special opportunity to hear our legislators share their values and their proposals for reforming cash bail. A big mahalo to our moderators, Na'i and Carrie Ann. You folks were amazing. We also want to thank our legislators here this evening for their leadership and let them know that they are not alone in this hard work of getting their bills into law. Uh, we ask all of you to be leaders and reaching out to your communities and educating folks about cash bail and submitting testimony and communicating with our legislators around this issue during the 2022 legislative session. Mm -hmm. And lastly, um, I want to share the words from panelists from our last cash bail panel. Um, these are from Sarah and Michael Gaspar of Makaha. And they shared, we need more people like you folks to stand up for us. We need our politicians and our people in higher places to do more things that's going to give more instead of taking. And lastly, in the spirit of co-liberation, I want to leave you with this quote from Lila Watson. She's a Murray activist. She's an indigenous Australian activist. And she says, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So thank you all for joining us this evening and um, we will definitely be in touch. Good night. Thanks everybody. Hello everybody. Good night everybody. <laughs>